TV and film have long been mediums that both reflect and exaggerate real life on screen, most notably their portrayal of various occupations and lifestyles that often don't add up to a character's salary or a realistic work schedule. We've covered inaccuracies like these before, from lofty TV-sized apartments to workplace comedies where people hardly work. Oh my god! Okay, it's happening! Everybody stay calm! What's the Everybody procedure, stay everyone? Calm. What's the procedure? Stay f calm! Though it's understandable why Hollywood takes creative liberties about work culture to allocate more time for plot and fun side stories, it is interesting that most fictional characters on screen seem to live beyond their means. I made $400 today already. I hired an extremely diverse ethnic smorgasbord of unpaid interns. Turns out I'm an effective leader. Let's take a look at some common jobs on screen that seriously toy with reality, what they actually make in the real world, and the few portrayals that get it right. Film and TV can't seem to get enough of the struggling artist archetype. But ironically, their actual struggles are rarely depicted accurately on screen. Hollywood loves protagonists who are idealists with big dreams that become disillusioned when life doesn't go as planned, forcing them to take the unconventional path where they encounter a love interest or zany sidekick. And somehow, many of these characters manage to afford to live in sizable apartments or even a renovated fire station, and order takeout nightly in some of the most expensive cities in the world like Paris or San Francisco. The average freelance writer in the United States makes around $23 per hour, which can vary depending on whether you live in a big metropolitan area like New York City. Still, a writer's salary even in a metropolis like New York or Los Angeles often can't cover rent, living expenses, and health insurance let alone a designer shopping habit. While I decided to investigate this theory I had about shopping as a way to unleash the creative subconscious. One glaring falsehood in film and TV's portrayal of writers is that so many of these characters are solely supported by their writing careers. I like my money right where I can see it, hanging in my closet. In reality, most writers, even those who have written for prominent publications and have won awards, work multiple jobs to pay the bills. As Kate Dwyer puts it, without any other revenue streams, it's it's highly unlikely that someone could make ends meet or support a family by writing novels. Most novelists have day jobs, and the majority of those who don't are either independently wealthy or juggling a handful of projects at once, often in different mediums like film, journalism, and audio. Over the years, Hollywood has even gone somewhat meta by centering characters who are aspiring actors. Do you think Meryl Streep and Kaylee Cuoco became stars just because they're the best? Yes. No. no. It's because they wanted it the most. Or seasoned entertainers. You're forgetting about your third bucket. People from Florida. They love me. And my numbers are strong. You'll still be doing shows, just not Friday and Saturday. Showing how cutthroat and dehumanizing the industry can be. Most actors, unless you're Meryl Streep, are constantly auditioning in between shifts, putting together last minute tapes for agents who barely make it in time for their clients who aren't making them commission. I think people are gonna soon see what I can see, which is actually that Dexter Mayhew is growing up. Realistically, Joey on Friends probably couldn't afford to live in New York City as a part-time actor, which makes you wonder how much rent money he owed his buddy Chandler. Of course, we'd have an apartment over the garage where Joey could grow old. And though Jerry on Seinfeld is an established comedian, making regular appearances at the Comedy Cellar or late night TV, in real life, his income as a B-list celebrity probably wouldn't afford him that massive apartment or allow him to dine out every day. I have a sixth sense. <laughs> Cheapness is not a sense. And things are even worse nowadays. Only comedians who sell up big venues or get Netflix specials can even hope to sustain themselves on their comedy career alone. When movies and shows do show any of the struggle that comes with being a freelance creative of any kind, it's usually framed comedically. On the one hand, this makes sense. It is supposed to be entertainment, after all. But it can also help create very real misunderstandings about what the lifestyle is really like, which can then, in turn, make creatives who are really struggling feel like they're just doing something wrong, when the truth is that most freelance creatives aren't pulling in enough to pay their bills consistently, much less spend every day at endless brunch. Work procedurals provide a comforting, problem-solving story formula that often serves to romanticize the work while also framing it as the thing that singularly defines a person's identity. Healing begins when someone bears witness. 
I saw you. I believe you. They serve the idea that our work is our worth and often completely ignore the reality that most people are overworked and underpaid and that our jobs shouldn't be the only focus of our lives. On screen, teachers are often depicted as doing A-OK -okay financially. Their biggest problems usually revolve around inspiring their students. Even if we do see that they're not pulling in much money, it's often shown as being worth it because the work is so important. But the reality is very different. Teachers often have to struggle to make ends meet. And on top of being barely able to afford to cover their own needs with their low salaries, are also expected to pay for everything in their classrooms, which can add up very quickly. Teachers' pay hasn't kept up with inflation at all. According to a report by the National Education Association, teachers on average make $3,644 less than they did 10 years ago, adjusted for inflation. On Boy Meets World, Cory and the gang's teacher Mr. Feeney can afford a very nice house and seemingly has plenty of free time to always just be around. New Girl's Jessica Day is a very passionate teacher who loves her students, but having so much free time for shenanigans and being able to afford to live in a huge loft in downtown Los Angeles, even with roommates, is pretty unrealistic. Mean Girls showed a bit more of the real struggle of being a teacher, both with the difficulty of dealing with young people and Miss Norbury having to get a second job at the mall just to make ends meet. My Nana takes her wig off when she's drunk. Your Nana and I have that in common. No, uh, actually, I'm just here because I bartend a couple nights a week down at PJ Calamities. Abbott Elementary has been praised for its realistic portrayal of the public education system, which is notoriously underfunded. While much of the activity on the show takes place in the teacher's lounge or in between classes, the writers make sure we see just how tired and overworked these teachers are, which feels true to real life. Abbott Elementary's wonderful blend of realism with comedy and characters viewers can relate to is what makes the show such a triumph and has reinvented the work comedy genre. I still have to stop and remind myself why I'm still here. It's not my paycheck. It's about the people who show up here every blessed day. Hollywood also wants us to know that there are benefits to centering your whole life around a career, even if those benefits are exaggerated for visual purposes. One career that's often glamorized on screen is the legal profession. Usually portrayed as charismatic and brilliant, lawyers on TV and film tend to have a lot of free time to flaunt their wealth and then just swan into the courtroom occasionally to win over juries through dramatic theatrics while wearing expensive, chic, tailored suits. Can't take the fifth, Mr. Santana. This isn't a criminal case. What color was the light? In reality, lawyers spend most of their time doing unglamorous work like legal research, drafting contracts, and negotiating settlements without ever going to court, which can take months, if not years. The salary range for lawyers is pretty wide and depends on multiple factors, such as what type of law they're practicing, if they work for a corporation or big city firm, versus working in the public sector. What we feel, what you feel, will determine what happens to the rest of this young man's life. And where they're geographically located. For example, a local attorney in Albuquerque, New Mexico, wouldn't make nearly as much as an attorney in a major city who works on behalf of a corporation's interests. I mean, they'll smile at you, they'll pat you on the head, but they are never, ever letting you in. On Suits, Harvey, a senior equity partner at a New York City law firm, spends his seven-figure salary on designer cars, clothes, private club memberships, and fine dining his uber-rich clients. In real life, senior equity partners do make a lot of money, pocketing around $1.39 million per year. But their jobs also carry a lot of risk, making Harvey's lifestyle choices questionable at best. Attorney, I close situations. Mm. So you only care about money? Truth is, I do it for the children. While Harvey's salary might make sense given his high status and work in the corporate sector, on screen, it seems like nearly every lawyer is living a lavish senior partner life. On Ally McBeal, the titular character seemed to spend more time worrying about her love life than her cases. It was the 90s, and yet is still apparently putting in enough billable hours to be able to afford a huge apartment and endless cocktails. Sex in the City's Miranda also has a suspiciously large amount of free time for a corporate lawyer. Okay, they don't make cosmopolitan. It's a Staten Island iced tea. Is that like a Long Island iced tea? I think so. Hello, I'm drunk. 
One under-discussed aspect of on-screen pay for any profession, including lawyers, is the gender pay gap. Female lawyers reportedly make about 26.5% less than male lawyers. And, of course, the gap is even worse for women of color. We get a more realistic example of the realities, good and bad, of being a lawyer on Insecure. When we first meet Molly, she is a high-powered lawyer in Los Angeles who lives in a gorgeous studio apartment with her dog and closet full of designer clothes. And while Molly is often shown dining out with her friends or dates or splurging on a luxury Airbnb, we clearly see that she works hard to afford and sustain her lifestyle. In spite of all the hours she puts into her job, Molly learns that her white male co-workers make more than her for doing less work. I'm uh, thinking about putting a buzz in their ear for a raise. No, <laughs> You've been buzzing already? <laughs> about a raise? Boy, so they can expect even more out of me? No. The effect this has on Molly and her painful attempts to be accepted into the all-boys club evokes a sobering realism that makes Insecure's portrayal of corporate life feel much more true to reality. I thought I was killing it. You know, it doesn't even matter. I get it. It's an all-boys club. And whatever I got to do to get in, I'll just figure it out. While still retaining its signature comedic prowess. That's why I make sure my white clients get less on their tax returns. Preparations. From Josh Baskin's charmed life as a toy tester to fictional pastry chefs with perfect hair and makeup and beyond, work life on screen can be a fancy free dream packaged in sensual visuals and colorful jargon to keep viewers engaged. A change of control needs a supermajority in the holding company. Mom got us that in the divorce. We'd need us on board. Most college professors don't live in a Victorian mansion off campus, unless they're independently wealthy. And even your average architect in New York City makes only between $68,000 to $79,000 a year, meaning instead of living the lavish life, they're probably having to think about getting a side hustle to make ends meet. I see a life that I know I can have here. I see a lawsuit. But that doesn't mean it isn't fun to watch. At the end of the day, movies and shows are meant to be entertaining dreams to lose ourselves in for a few minutes. It can be a problem when they give us super unrealistic expectations about work and life, but when done right, they can help give us the drive to chase our dreams and hopefully get paid fairly for it. We only had time to cover a few here, so let us know. What other jobs, salaries, and lifestyles do you think film and TV gets majorly wrong? Or right? That's the take. Click here to watch the video we think you'll love, or here to check out a whole playlist of awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. And make sure to subscribe to our Patreon for exclusive new videos.